keeping that in mind and keeping in mind the fact that we as as believers from the greatest or from the very first qualities mentioned in the Quran is that we believe in the unseen alif lam mim dhalika al kitab la riba la riba fi hudan lil muttaqin alladhina yu'minuna bil ghaib so the very first description or the quality of the believers in the Quran is that they believe in the unseen right and this is from this is from you know intelligence this is from a uh, sense that that you believe in that which you cannot directly perceive right because in creation there's more than what any one of us can simply perceive with his eyes or with his ears or with his smell or with his touch right so to believe in the unseen is from you know from from reason to do that because most of our knowledge that we get does not come directly from our own physical senses right this applies to everybody all the knowledge that you hold the vast majority of that knowledge did not come to you through your own physical senses it came through other things right obviously through akhbar which is the major thing akhbar meaning reports from the reports of others so because this is an issue where for example the the, the, the people of kufr the people of disbelief you know they may mock the believer or they may mock the people of iman and they may say well you you believe in fairy tales you believe in this you believe in that all right but when we believe when we say when we believe in the unseen we are believing in everything that exists and from that in fact in the quran which is where i want to uh, move into uh the, the quran describes or divides the whole of everything which exists into two categories right it is either the ghaib the ghaib or it is the shahada right so this is the description of the quran of whatever exists all that exists including allah azza wa jal right it is either the ghaib or it is the shahada the ghaib meaning that which we can't see and the shahada that which we can see right so in the quran allah azza wa jalla he says dhalika alimu alghaib wa shahada al aziz ar rahim surah sajda that is the knower meaning speaking about allah the knower the one who knows the ghaib the unseen and the shahada that which is observed and witnessed and there are, this this occurs like this alimul ghaib wa shahada occurs 10 times in the quran in 10 different verses and also alimul ghaib la yudhhiru ala ghaibihi ahada the knower of the unseen he does not make manifest his unseen to anybody الا من ارتضى من الرسول except for the one whom he's pleased from amongst a messenger right so in the quran the description of everything that exists or, or the 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 categorization of everything which exists is either it is from the ghaib or it is from the shahada right why is this important for us to know because we are we are now entering into some very very important uh, questions about what exists and how do we gain knowledge of that right this is a very very important issue right what exists what's out there and how do we acquire knowledge of that right there's a two issues which many many people of philosophy in the past and in the present they speak about and they made great mistakes in fact this is the very topic these are the very topics that sheikh al islam ibn taymiyah rahimahullah he's discussing these very things in his books when he's refuting either 
the philosophers, or the people of Kalam, right? The, the Ash'aris, Maturidis, the Jahmiya, and people. Because they made tremendous mistakes in these topics, right? So there's two things. One is, what's out there? What is out there? Right? In, in, in English, they use, we don't need to use these, you know, we don't use these philosophical terms, but they have a, they have, they have labels for these things, right? This is called ontology. Ontology. Right? O N T O L O G Y. Ontology. Which simply means, what's out there? What exists? What is its reality? What is, what is its nature? What's out there? And the second thing is, how do you acquire knowledge of that? What's the route to acquiring knowledge of that? And again, they have these terms in, in, you know, they call it epistemology, which is, you know, what's the route through which you acquire knowledge? Right? But these two questions, they, obviously they are important for us as believers because we need to know what exists, what's out there. What's out there? Right? And also, how do we acquire knowledge of what is out there? Right? So the, these are two important questions. We, we have to make sure that we are, you know, very clear about these things so that we don't go astray uh, like the philosophers, like the materialists, and like many from those who ascribe to Islam, uh, like the people of Kalam, they, they also erred in these issues as well. So, so I want to speak a little bit about this before we come into discussing the bliss and the punishment of the grave, because that is from the unseen. It's from the unseen. But I want to mention some general principles or general points on this topic, which basically it's overwhelmingly discussed by Shaykh Al-Islam Ibn Taymi Rahimahullah. And uh, so, okay, I mentioned very briefly the first question, what is out there? What's out there? Right? So the Qur'an has divided what is out there into two categories. Right? It is either from the ghaib, from that which we cannot see, or it is from the shahada, that which we can see, that which we can observe. That's briefly. I'm going to come back to this inshallah. I'm going to come back to this uh, shortly. The second question, which is, how do we know, how do we know what is out there? As, as in, what's the root of knowledge? How do we acquire knowledge? And basically, there are, there are three, three levels or three roots. Right? The first one is al-his. Al-his. Al-his means sensory perception. Right? So, this is the vision. I can see you all. I can see each one of you. Each one is a separate entity. I can see with my eyes. Right? I can hear. I can hear someone speaking. Right? That's sensory perception. I have the sense of touch. Well, I know this, this is obviously, it's there, you know. Um, and, and the same with, you know, everything else with touch. And then the smell. And, um, you know, taste. Right? This is what we call sensory perception. And this can be zahir. It can be outward. Right? So, outward from myself. So I can perceive this, I can, I can touch this, and I can, there's a texture of the carpet there, and I can smell, you know. This is how I know that there's something out there, right? But also, if you have feelings and emotions, you experience and feel those emotions as well, right? So this now is, this is like within the body. So you experience joy. You experience fear. Right? You have these internal feelings which you can experience. They are, they are true and they are real, right? Okay. So, this is the first way through which we can know things. That we can know what's out there. The second way is by way of reason, al-aqal. By reasoning. Right? And reason itself the reason, the aql that we have itself, it falls into two categories. 
right? The first one is what's called Badihat Daruriya. Badihat Daruriya. This is something that really comes from the fitra, right? It comes from the fitra. And it means like the most basic elementary principles, which we know to be true, which we don't need to think about, but we know they are true, right? And these come from the fitra. For example, I know that something can't be in two places at the same time. I know this bottle is here. I know it can't be outside. Right? And this is something known even by a child, a baby. Right? A child or a baby, you can see from, from instinct, when it's looking for a, for a toy that's over there, it always goes to that toy. It never thinks, you know what, it's in, it could be in two places at the same time. Because it instinctively knows that's not true. Right? Right? So there are certain things that we, that we know, we, they, they instinctively, they are true. This this comes from the fitra itself, right? And reason itself is built upon the fitra, right? So that's one of two, badihat, daruriya. And the other way from reason is where we basically, we reflect, we look, and we make analogies, and we, you know, we, 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 we learn about the world. We use reason to learn about the world, right? So we So we look at things, by way of our senses, and um, we look at uh, things that happen, events that take place, relationships, and you know, we, we, we then use our reason to then figure out more things than what we just know by the physical senses. Right? This is the use of reason. This is what we call al etibar bin nazar wal qiyas. Right? Meaning that we that we look, we make analogies, and we reflect, and then we acquire knowledge about the world around us, right? Which is more than just what we, you know, through through the through you know through the the, the vision of the eyes or of the hearing, right? So this now is reason, akal. This is another route to gaining knowledge of what's out there, what's out there, right? So. Let me give an example to illustrate this. Like, imagine you have um, uh, something, a device, and you know you you switch it on, and you point it to you know the the um, you know the carpet there, and it starts burning. It starts burning. Right now, you know that you can't see whatever it is. We we we, we can't see anything. We can see that it started burning, and we can see that it correlates with whatever device it is. You know some laser or something like that so therefore we know by reason we know by reason that there's got to be something going on right between between this and that that that's causing the fire right there's something has to be there right so this is what i mean that that you know you have al his first of all then the second one is reason the use of reason and reason itself is of two types the third way of acquiring knowledge the third way of acquiring knowledge is al-khabar al-khabar the third route to knowledge is al-khabar which is reports truthful reports and this is something that the people of disbelief that they would reject this but truthful reports a khabar sadiq is a, a true and valid root of knowledge. And this includes revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? It is, it is a truthful report. And we can gain knowledge about the seen and the unseen from revelation. Right, so all of this is to do with how do we acquire knowledge of things. Very clear now, right? So now you have a basic framework. What's out there? What's out there? Tell me, what's what's out there? What are the two categories? Right? Obviously there's things that come under each category. But there's al-ghayb, that we can't see. And there is al-shahada, that we can see. 
Right. And then in terms of how do we acquire knowledge about things, then it is by way of number one. What's the first one? al his, which is just the physical senses. The physical senses, you know, we know things are out there, we can feel, perceive, experience, we know, you know, there's entities, you know, there's, there's a person, there's a tree, there's this or whatever. We can see all that. There's, you know, the, 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 the clouds, the, everything, we can see that. The second thing is a reason, al aqal and this, there are two levels of this. The first one is basic elementary principles that we know instinctively they are true. Right? This is something which is from the fitra that Allah has put in every child, every person. We know instinctively they are true. And this is basically what the basis of all science really stems from. Right? It actually comes from sound principles of the fitra. Right? And then you have reason, uh, where you use a reflection, you look at things and you uh, make observations and you make rational deduction, you use your mind to understand things. And then you gain more knowledge, right? This is from reason. And the third is khabar, which is the report. The report. Right? Which we, which, and most of our knowledge comes from reports. Most of the knowledge you hold in your head right now did not come from your own experience. It has come from the reports from other people. Right? And it's impossible for a person with his own physical senses to go and learn about everything that's out there. Right? Has anybody, you know, has anybody been to China here? Has has anybody not been to China? Okay. How do you know China exists? Well, you've never been there. You've never flown over it. All you've heard people saying for hundreds of years, there's a place over in the East called China. Right? And most of the knowledge you have has come through akhbar, through reports. Right, so these are the ways about uh, about how we know what's out there. Right, so the first question is what's out there, and the second question is how do we acquire knowledge of what is out there? Okay, right. So so now, how many points have we mentioned so far? We said first of all that from the first qualities of the believer described in the Quran is that they believe in the unseen. Right? That they believe in the unseen. This is in the Quran. Alladina yu'minuna bil ghaib. This is the first quality mentioned about the believers in the Quran. The second thing that we said is that in terms of what's out there, right, is divided into the ghaib and the shahada. That which is unseen and that which is seen. The third thing that we said is what are the roots to knowledge of what's out there, right? And it is either it is his, which is sensory perception, or it is reason, or it is a truthful report, right? A truthful report, right? These are three points, all that clear. The next point is very important to understand, is that we have to make a distinction between what exists in your mind only and what exists outwardly as in and is real yes so there's that thing which is fil adhan that which exists only in your mind and that which exists actually external to your mind it's true and real It has a true and real existence. Right. The reason why this is very important is because if you do not distinguish between these two things, you're going to start believing in things which are not true. Right. This is what happened to the people of philosophy, the Greek philosophers. And it's what's happening today with the scientists today as well. Right. Where you imagine something in the mind... You think, oh, this this is mathematically, this is proven. But in physical reality, you've got no proof for it. You just think it exists in the mind, right? You understand? Right? So, so to distinguish between what the mind thinks of, and which is only just a mental concept or a mental idea, 
and between what actually is out there. They are not the same thing. Do you understand? Like for example, in the mind, many more things can exist that actually exist. Right? I'm going to give you some examples now of, of what this means. Right, so so in terms of what's out there, like if I said to you, if I said to you, um, if I said to you, uh, mercy, ar-rahma, ar-rahma, is it a thing? Is it a thing out there, like the bottle, right? Like the microphone, like you know, a bag. Is is it a person, or is mercy a notion, a mental idea in the mind that we that we that we uh, have? When we look at things that take place externally, which of the two is it? Sorry? Which is in the mind, right? It's a notion in the mind, right? Because you don't see, you can't say, look, there's mercy. I saw mercy, you know, in the park yesterday. You don't speak like that because this is a mental notion in the mind, right? So there are many things which are only mental ideas. So we make a distinction between that and between what's actually out there. What's out there and which is which is what we call an ainun. Ainun mean an entity, right? Or something which is qaimun binafsihi, which is a standalone entity, right? This is a standalone entity. It's different to the pen, right? This is a standalone entity, meaning its existence is separate and distinct from this thing here, right? So, so we have to make this distinction that. Things exist either as a concept in the mind or they exist outside of the mind. Right? If I said to you, if I, if I imagine in my mind an elephant that can fly, you know, a thousand miles per hour, I can think of that in my mind, but does it, does it actually exist? No, does it exist? No, it doesn't exist. Right? This mistake where you think that what the mind thinks of somehow must be real outside of the mind is a mistake that many philosophers and even scientists today, this is a mistake that they make, right? And on the basis of that, they are led to tremendous errors, tremendous mistakes, by not distinguishing between what's in the mind only and what actually exists outside of the mind, right? And this is the one of the ways that the people of, of you know the atheism, materialism, uh, scientists, philosophers today they, they play this trick, right? Where whatever the mind tries to conceive or think of, and they do that in science, they do that in you know in physics, they do that in many different sciences. And then they, they, sometimes they, they themselves are mistaken. They, they don't realize that this is a mistake they are making. And other times they, um, you know, deliberately play these tricks to make you believe something that is not really true and out there. This happens a lot in, in physics, in particle physics and things like that. Right? They, they do equations on paper and they think, oh, we, these equations tell us that there, there has to be a particle out there. This type of particle, whatever. They've got, they got no knowledge, no evidence, no way to detect it, no, nothing at all. But it's just that, you know, based upon um, the, the mathematics, they believe it must be out there. And then they go on a wild goose chase for, you know, and spend billions of dollars and they don't, you know, find anything. Right? So this mistake of not distinguishing between what the mind thinks of and what's actually out there it's very important to 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 understand that difference, right? So we differentiate, point number four, we differentiate between the mind, what it thinks, and what's actually true and real, what actually exists. Okay, so now we need to give some examples. Right, so from, from, from what's out there, there is the ghaib and the shahada, right? I want you to give me examples of what is from the shahada. Stars, huh? Huh? Stars, moon, yeah, like the, the heavens, the earth, yeah. the stars, the sun, the moon, the trees, the mountains, humans, right? All of these are things that we experience, we can see, 
and they are what we call perceptible. These are things which are perceptible. That you can um, uh, perceive them with the senses. Right? There are also some things which would be included in this category. Because remember I said to you before, that not only is, is the shahada like things outside of your body, but you yourself, you can feel your emotion of love, yes? You feel the emotion of fear, yes? You can feel and perceive it, you experience it, don't you, right? And you experience joy, and you experience uh, apprehension. These things which are inside your body, joy, anger, things like that, these are also from the shahada, right? But this is a different category. It's not something that you see with your eyes. It's not something that you hear with your hearing. It's not something that you taste. It's not something that you touch, right? But this is an inner experience of the body that you know is true and real and exists, right? So, because there's obviously there's a soul. So, from the shahada, is you, you know that there's a soul inside of you which animates your body, which gives life to your body, right? And also from, included in this category is also, is Allah Zawajal, not in the sense that we are seeing Allah Himself, but in the sense that we can see His handiwork, right? And inwardly in the fitra, we know that through the shahada, that Allah Zawajal, you know, exists, although we can't actually see Him uh, directly, Right, so this is what we mean from the shahada, Any, anything that's directly, you know, observable. On the other hand, that which is from the ghayb, that which we can't see, we can't see. Right, this is anything that we cannot see in this world. It doesn't mean that it cannot be seen. It just means that we can't see in this world. Right. So in this, examples of this would be Allah Azza wa Jal, we can't see Allah, paradise, hellfire, these things are actually true and real and they exist, right? How do we know this? From Al-Khabar, from a truthful report. And the angels and the jinn, we can't see the angels, we can't see the jinn, these are true and real beings and entities which exist. And they are made out of, you know, uh, we, we are made uh, from from clay and dust and, and the minerals therein, along with other things, water and other things. The angels are made of light and the jinn are made of the, you know, smokeless part of the, of the fire. But we can't, we can't really see them. We can't see them. It's not that they can't be seen. It's that in this life, we are not able to see them. Right? And you know also, you also know that even amongst Allah's creation, there are some creatures that can hear things that we are unable to hear. That's true, isn't it? Yes, true. The, 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 the dogs and things like that, they can hear things that we can't hear. Likewise, there are things that can smell things that we can't smell. And likewise, there are certain types of birds, for example, who have a type of vision it's like a telescopic topic vision. They can see a prayer from like miles away. We can't see that. Right? So even within this creation, in what Allah has created, what is ghayb is relative from creature to creature. And even person to person. Right? Because the ghayb is relative. In this room, what's behind me in that room is from the ghayb. Right? And likewise, what's, what's over there in China is from the ghayb. Because I can't see it. And likewise, paradise and hellfire, this is from the ghayb. It's all relative. So, so Allah Azawajal is the alimul ghaybi wa shahada. He is the knower of all of that, all of what exists. Alimul ghaybi wa shahada. And so Allah knows all of that. But, you know, obviously from, from our point of view, um, we can only we can only see that which you are which we are able to see, and as for those things that uh, the ghayb the ghayb is only temporary, right? It's only temporary, and there's a point beyond which all of the limitations in our seeing and hearing they will be gone. 
This will be on Yawmul Qiyamah. Yawmul Qiyamah, or when you enter into the Barzakh, after death. After death. Right? The distinction between the Ghaib and the Shahada will be gone. And thereupon, you will be able to be, be able to see things, perceive things that you are not able to see and perceive now. In fact, even in the life of this world, there are examples of this. Like, for example, if you if you took an infrared light and you shine it on a surface, you can see things that you can't see with the vision of the eyes. Yes, this is an example in the life of this world. And so, after death. And on Yawmul Qiyamah, there will be, and Allah knows best how, you know, Allah will change and alter things, that where the, where, where the ghaib will no longer be from the ghaib. Right? So we will be able to see things and perceive things that we were not able to see and perceive in the life of this world. Right? And this is when we will have ilmul yaqeen or aynul yaqeen right? in the Quran. There's a type of knowledge which is ilmul yaqeen, right? Where you know something is true, but then there is aynul yaqeen. Okay, so this is really point five and six that we gave examples of the ghaib, we gave examples of the shahada, the unseen and the seen, and we mentioned that there will come a time when the distinction will be gone, right? So what is ghaib will no longer be from the ghaib. And, you know, when a person enters the grave and the soul departs from the body, right, there's a, a new type of perception and awareness where certain realities will become evident. And likewise, on Yom al you know, paradise, hellfire, and many other things, they, they, you will see them to be true and to be to be real and to be to be actual. So there's a point when that distinction will uh, will be gone. So all of this, what I mentioned here, really is just uh, to help us understand some of these important issues. Uh, they are dealt with in some detail in the books of you know Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah and others. And he's discussing the mistakes made by the people of philosophy in the past, but they are but they are, are the same mistakes which are made by people today as well. In fact, not only just the people of philosophy and science, but also there are people of other religions, right? They make mistakes in this field because it's to do with, you know, like like we said, um, feelings that you have. You experience certain feelings and the way you interpret those feelings, right? How do you interpret? What do they refer to? What do they relate to? And so you'll see some people speaking about, yes, you know, there's a, I merged with a higher consciousness and, you know, sometimes they can't tell whether, you know, uh, are they possessed by a jinn or have they opened up their body to, for, for a jinn to enter? And this is why you see many of these people like, you know, they have these uh, seances, Right, where they, where they, uh, try to connect with, with the spirits and things like this. And so, these shayateen, they, they, they play with their minds and they play with their feelings. And then they believe things which are not really true. Right? And they start building ideas and concepts and even whole religions on the back of these experiences, right? So, I've only just very briefly introduced some of these principles here, just, you know, so we put into context this, this topic that we are discussing about the grave and about the soul when it leaves the body, right? What happens after death, right? So six points, just, you know, as a framework for now. The first description of the believers in the Quran in the very second or third verse is that they believe in the unseen. In fact, there is no person on this earth except that he believes in the unseen. This is an absolute reality. No person can escape from believing in something from the unseen. Right? Even the atheist, even nobody can escape ex escape this. Right? That, that they believe something they, can, they cannot prove 
with, with, with the senses. That's number one. Number two, the whole of existence is divided in the Quran into the ghayb and the shahada. The unseen and the, and, and, and the seen. Right? And all of this is relative. This is relative. Allah Azawajal is alimul ghaybi wa shahada. He knows everything that exists. As for us, what is the seen, what is the unseen, it is relative. We cannot see the jinn. We cannot see the angels. The jinn can see us, but there's some things that they cannot see. Right? And likewise, there are, there are animals that can see things that other animals can, cannot see. There are some animals that can, through sound, can see things that others cannot see. All of this varies. Allah has created different, you know, entities and beings and give them different levels of the ability to see and perceive. Right? So, all of the, of existence is either the ghayb or the shahada. Number three, how do we acquire knowledge of that? Three roots. Number one is al-his, by sensory perception. Number two is by reason. By reason, right? Elementary principles from the fitrah, and then just investigation and, and reason and deduction. And thirdly, it is al-khabar, which is the most important here, which is reports from other people. Most of our knowledge that we hold in our head has come through reports from other people. Right? And that's, that's a valid, correct, truthful source of information so long as the, the transmission is, is, you know, reliable and true. Fourth point, I said, that it's important to distinguish between what the mind thinks of and what's actually out there physically. It's not the same thing. Right? Because the mind can think of many ideas, concepts and things, some of which might be impossible, some of which don't even exist. But what's actually out there is something else. And uh, fifthly, we said, or we gave examples of the ghayb and the shahada. And sixthly, we said that in the hereafter or when a person dies, that distinction will be gone and a person will be able to see more things than they are able to perceive in the life of this world, right? So from those things which enter into the unseen is the grave. And when you're buried in the grave, and when the soul is removed from you, and obviously your body uh, dies, and it starts to perish. And so there is, you know, a, a period of time that you are in what we call the barzakh. The barzakh is a partition. It's the intermediate stage between this world and the hereafter when everybody is resurrected and when there will be true justice and there will be recompense and reward right for a person's deeds. So the Shaykh mentioned a hadith 